So earlier this summer, I went to Vienna, which was very fun. I got to visit my friend, but I also got to visit a lot of their museums, which are really awesome. They have like this whole, it's like a museum's quarter. And oh my gosh, there's so many, like a few different art museums and like natural history museum. One of the things I was most excited to see, or one of the artists I was most excited to see was Klimt, Gustav Klimt who was born in 1862. I think he graduated 1883 from like the Applied Arts School. And from there, he started working on significant buildings around the uh, Ringstrasse. A lot of uh, like mural paintings and ceiling paintings uh, for like the opera house and like the theater, the very important downtown buildings. And he had a pretty classical style. So yeah, uh, I was very excited to see Klimt. We went to the Belvedere Museum uh, where the Kiss is housed. And so I was very excited to see the Kiss. But in the room before the Kiss, there's this painting, which is unfinished, called The Bride, which was painted from 1917 to 1918. So one of the first things I noticed when I encountered Klimt's work was the difference between the rendering of humans and and flesh and their surroundings. So in this painting, The Bride, we see it's like patchy, sickly flesh, but it's also rendered in a way that's realistic, right? Like you can see uh, that a leg is not just like a sheet of canvas that's been like cut out. It's like got some shading and it's got some depth to it whereas the elements that are surrounding and and the background are very abstract they're flat against the canvas almost like cubism and so that contrast really got me thinking and it was early in the trip and I was uh, seeing Klimt's in other museums um, and I was, I was thinking about it more and more so before we get into that um, let's just do a little background on Klimt himself. Uh, so Klimt was the son of a gold engraver. He studied in school architectural painting and pursued a career in that. So like I said, painting murals and ceilings of, of buildings that were important uh, in Vienna at the time. Erit Rogoff writes about the kinds of painting that he was doing uh, early in his career. It was the turbulent, non illusionary space and the colors of the Baroque the busy use of the oriental, I would venture orientalist because that's a complex word to be using, motif and pattern employed by the Rococo and the dense asymmetry, gold leafing and abstract ornamentation of Islamic art, which were the true foundations of a public art tradition on which Viennese modernism was to emerge. And so we can certainly see like this type of style that's being described that's uh, very busy, very kind of Baroque in his early uh, commissions. However, this changed drastically uh, when Klimt received a commission from the University of Vienna to paint the ceiling of their kind of main atrium. He was to paint three paintings, jurisprudence, philosophy, and medicine. And so the paintings that Klimt produced for this commission um, were a hard left turn into the avant-garde, into some of the impressionist and more abstract painting approaches that were relevant at the time. This was not re well received by the administrators of the commission, and the commission was canceled in 1901. And so lacking the institutional support that he once enjoyed, uh, Klimt went off and devoted much more of his energy to the Vienna succession, which he helped to found several years earlier. So now that we have uh, some background on Klimt, let's go back to this idea of the realistic figures and the more abstract backgrounds. So this didn't click for me until I was in another museum uh, and I saw a wall label for Egon Schiele's work, who was a uh, contemporary painter to Klimt, actually more of a mentee of, of Klimt's. So this wall label basically laid out this idea that during that time, especially in Vienna, this idea of the single unified, uh, you might say like simple self was breaking down, especially in the realm of philosophy and psychology with Freud uh, and others. And it was giving way to this idea of a more complex, constructed, fragmented personality or self. These artists and the core of what made their art interesting for the time was that they were exploring these ideas of self that were new and emerging in a very particular way that was much more nuanced. My argument is basically that by abstracting uh, away the setting and background of portraiture, Schiele and uh, Klimt 
carved out more space for themselves to explore psyches and to explore their subject more intimately. One art historian and critic uh, went so far as to compare the work that Klimt was doing uh, to the work of several philosophers. Klimt, like a number of contemporaries such as Sigmund Freud, Otto Weidinger, Karl Kraus, George Trekkel, and Adolf Luce, were preoccupied with investigating a conceptual understanding of ornamentation as facade and how to give that understanding a material rendition. So we've been talking a little bit abstractly. Um, I want to jump in to a particular painting that of Klimt's that uh, really illustrates this point. So that painting is Judith and the Head of Holofernes in 1901. This work is a modernist retelling of an apocryphal story uh, from the Bible, which has been represented in painting for hundreds of years. It's a like kind of traditional subject, biblical subject. It depicts Judith holding the head of Holofernes, who she has just decapitated, uh, thereby saving her people in the narrative. And so despite the gruesome context of the story, Judith is portrayed in an undeniably sexy way. Like she is smoldering at the viewer. Throughout the history of like representation of the subject, Judith is usually not sexualized. And at least if she is sexualized, she's, she's sexualized by the gaze of men. It's very male gazy. Whereas we have here uh, Judith looking out at us challenging the viewer. So at the time, we have a lot of post-impressionism um, and artists who are challenging illusionary painting. Uh, and things are becoming flatter on the canvas. So if you look at the trees behind Judith's head, they're not real depictions of trees, right? They're not realistic. They're flattened against the surface of the canvas, and they literally sit on the surface of the canvas with the gold leafing process. So additionally, there's no deep space behind Judith. It's as though she's like wrapped in a container for like a doll or something where the background is kind of painted on to one solid plane uh, and she's kind of pressed against the plastic cover of it. There's like a constriction that's happening. And so as we further examine uh, Judith's figure, we see even more of these uh, decorative elements encroaching on her space, constraining her. So if you look at the top she's wearing, there's this blue wispy fabric that looks kind of like it's enveloping her body and like laying flat against her curves right like as a normal piece of clothing would as the like lines of my shirt are distorted by my body however as part of this garment there's a like squiggly uh, golden kind of element and if we look closely like to the garment itself it's almost as if it's not part of the top it's like pressed against the canvas and like is rigid and not moving and so again that kind of like constrains her in place so i think the most intrusive and like violently constraining element of the painting uh is the choker that she's wearing it kind of creates a bridge between the decorative trees on e either side of her forcing the background uh and the foreground even closer together around her neck even so there's this sense of resistance right like she is a real person, and that's the by the way that she is painted, not as a symbol as the trees are, but as a modeled, deep, spatially human being. And so almost paradoxically, by not giving a realistic background to Judith, uh, there's almost more room for Klimt to explore the psyche and the fractured self. The painting feels fully and unapologetically about Judith. There's no background, there's no setting, there's no even like time going on. It's just her. So Irit Rogoff uh, posits that Klimt's paintings may even be exploring the unconscious, writing about jurisprudence, but I think it still applies. Jurisprudence attempts to reach beneath the veneer of recognizable epochs, sexual roles, or familiar narratives, and to provide a language for the manifestations of the subconscious, which were traditionally unacceptable to society. And so, like I mentioned before, this method of painting is also an example of the sitter's power. So I mentioned the male gaze, uh, and we've seen refutations to the male gaze in uh, paintings like Manet's Olympia. The female subject is nude, but is directly addressing the ma male gaze and challenging it. What's new here, though, is the struggle of the subject 
against the constraining order of the decoration. Judith doesn't feel at all controlled by Klimt, neither by being subsumed by his painting style, the abstract painting style, nor by the narrative content, which is complicated as compared to previous uh, renditions of Judith with the head of Holofernes. Pushing abstraction right up to the skin of realistically painted figures gives them unmatched power and that is the pictorial innovation that Klimt has here. So here that power is expressed as sexuality pushing back against the confining or you could say crystallizing cultural and sexual boundaries of the bourgeois liberal society in Vienna at the time. Rogoff says again, a non-symbolic and non-narrative depiction of the individual's tensions within accepted codes of behavior, of the hermetic quality of bourgeois society, and of the use of ornamentation as a form of imprisonment. It is one of the most surprising elements of the Vienna School of Painting that such trends and preoccupations persisted through at least three generations of artists, including Klimt, who are constantly reacting to the restriction of conventional social behavior and trying to find a formal language through which the other, more intuitive form of behavior could be expressed. I think what makes Klimt a great painter is the combination of the two aspects of the constraining kind of decorative backgrounds uh, and of the power of the subject struggling against those backgrounds. We could call this an exploration of interiority, exploring bo both what is inside the subject's unconscious as well as how the subject makes space against the confines of the background. So how does this show up in other paintings? Let's take a look at Klimt's most famous work, uh, which is The Kiss. Here we have a softening of nearly every feature that we can describe in Judith. The background, while still severely flat against the canvas, is not nearly as structured and hard. The figures are not quite choked by their apparel. However, there's an intense sense of interiority. The lovers are completely detached from any reality outside of their own in this embrace. I would argue the effect of this is much more intense uh, than if Klimt has, had painted the lovers in an actual field or against an actual background of a real place. The abstraction lets the viewer consider the lovers as they are. It's about them and nothing else. And even in the kiss, which in my eyes is like a very exuberant painting, uh, historians have read constraint. Arthur C. Danto writes, so it is striking that the flesh of Klimt's women contrast almost morbidly with the surrounding stuffs and stones and metals. It is bloodless and nearly necrotic. Very little of the lover's skin is shown in the kiss. The woman's face, her shoulder and elbow, her calves and feet, the man's neck. What we do see is gray-blue and lifeless, touched as by some mortuary cosmetician with rouge. Ornament is the state to which his figures aspire, and they are undergoing some kind of sea change that is to turn them, at last, into something beyond life and longing and decay. I don't think that I agree with this reading. Um, I think that the figures are shining as well as their background. Um, and I think maybe you could make the reading that the reason why they're not shining as bright is because of like the limitations of their mortal bodies uh, against this like cosmic idea of love that Clint is rendering. In either case, uh, it's clear that by placing his figures against these abstract backgrounds, Klimt opens up more conversations uh, about interiority, about the subjects and about uh, the constraint itself and how they're fighting against it. So the last painting I want to consider is Klimt's Death and Life, uh, painted from 1908 to 1915. Here, the figures on the right are masked so tightly that one can imagine it as almost like a topographical map of the island of humanity, standing out violently against the frothing sea of the void. The line delineating the shore of the island is a tectonic buildup of pressure. We get the sense of the void closing around the figures, but of them pushing back, defending their interiority and their community, basically illustrating the interiority of the figure against the background. We also get a sense of the figures' relations to each other. Uh, we get a maternal relationship, mourning lovers, and figures on the outskirts embracing. These relationships are multifaceted and ambiguous in some cases and in invite interpretation. But together, they make up a unity uh, that strongly fights against the void and against death, as suggested by the figure on the left. So what makes Klimt's paintings from 100 plus years ago resonate so powerfully with viewers today 
I believe it's their exploration of interiority, the preservation of oneself or one's community against a crystallizing political or cultural power structure is just as powerful, if not more, today uh, than it was 100 years ago. Klimt's paintings render glimmers of hope in the struggle of interiority, of Judith staring us down despite her confinement, of the lovers lost in their shared reverie, and of the human struggle against the void.